Now, we were thinking last month about this menage a trois of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. And Jacob, due to the machinations of his father-in-law, Laban, has been lumbered with Leah, the wife he didn't love and didn't want. The wife he did love was Leah's younger sister, Rachel. The Lord, however, is the God of the underdog, and he's moved, isn't he, by Leah's misery that she's not loved, and he enables her to become a veritable baby factory. And she gives birth to six sons of her own and also to a daughter. And then through her maidservant Zilpah, Leah goes on to have two far further sons by proxy. Rachel, in the meantime, although she's greatly loved by her husband, she appears to be infertile. And she becomes desperate. She's distraught. And if you just look at verse 1 of chapter 30, you see the pain of her words. Give me children or I'll die. And when her maidservant gives birth to two sons on her behalf, she feels vindicated to an extent, but it was still not the same as having giving birth to sons of her own. But then in chapter 30 and verse 22, we have these wonderful words. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. And Rachel gives birth at last to a son and calls him Joseph. And we were thinking two weeks ago that this is a picture of salvation. When God saves someone, he remembers them. He remembered Zacchaeus, the tax collector, perched in a sycamore tree and famously said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And in Genesis 30, we see the God of Israel working out his plan for what will become his people, Israel through Leah, Rachel, and their maidservants, and the sons they give birth to, he is establishing the 12 tribes of Israel. But the Lord, the God of Israel, is looking much further into the future than to the establishment of a nation. No, he's preparing the way for his kingdom. He is working out his eternal plan of salvation. Leah gives birth to Judah, from whom? The Lord Jesus Christ, the saviour of the world, will be descended. Rachel, in time, will give birth to a second son, Benjamin, from whom the apostle Paul will be descended, whose missionary exploits are recorded for future generations of Christians in Acts, and who gave the church 13 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. So we left the story before Christmas, with Rachel, broody, pining, verse 24, for another son. Now, our three readings this evening have covered a, a lot of narrative. And 14 years have elapsed since Rachel has arrived in Padam Aram. And he's had to work seven years for Laban in the hope of securing Rachel as his wife, only to find Leah lying next to him the morning after the wedding night. He's had to work another seven years for Laban after Laban gives him Rachel. And now, chapter 30 and verse 25, Jacob feels the call of home. And he wants to take his wives and children back to his home where his father Isaac is in Hebron. He feels he served his father-in-law Laban long enough and wants to return home. But Laban is not daft. Having Jacob as an employee has worked out well for him. And Laban acknowledges to Jacob in verse 27, the Lord has blessed me because of you. And they enter into a agreement about Jacob's shepherding of his flocks of lamb, sheep and goats, whereby Jacob will claim as his reward the rarer types of lamb, sheep and goats from among Laban's flocks. Thereupon Laban secretly reneges on the agreement and he removes all these rarer types of lamb, sheep and goats from his flocks, which it had been agreed would be Jacob's reward. And he puts them out of harm's way under the care of his sons, verse 35. 
And it seems that Jacob's prospects of building up flocks of his own were bleak. However, because the Lord's favour rests upon Jacob, by the end of chapter 30, he's become an extremely wealthy man with extensive flocks in his own right, as well as servants, camels and donkeys of his own. I'd like us then this evening to, to focus on chapter 31, having set the scene in chapter 30, in which the God of Bethel reappears to Jacob in verse 13. And the title that I've given to this evening's sermon is The God of Bethel Reappears. The God of Bethel Reappears. And I've got five very brief observations to make from the text concerning the God of Bethel who reappears to Jacob. And firstly, we see the God who has been silent. The God who has been silent. By the beginning of chapter 31, 20 years have passed since Jacob first arrived in Padam Aram and began working for Laban. He's had to work 14 years to secure Rachel's hand in marriage and then another six years managing Laban's flocks. And Laban's sons have become jealous of Jacob's success in building up his own flocks and increasing his wealth. But they exaggerate greatly when they claim in verse 1 of chapter 31 that Jacob has taken everything our father owned. No, in reality, Laban remained a wealthy man himself. But Jacob begins to feel that he's outstayed his welcome because he notices that Laban's attitude towards him was not as warm as it had once been. But here's the thing, here's the thing. In all these years, the God who had revealed himself to Jacob at Bethel has been silent. At Bethel 20 years earlier, the God of his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac had appeared to him in a dream. And it is the Old Testament equivalent of a New Testament conversion story. While Jacob is on the run from his brother Esau, who is intent on killing him, the Lord takes Jacob, the deceiver, by surprise and assures him that as he had been with Isaac, as he had been Isaac and Abraham's God, he would also be his God. And the Lord gives Jacob a wonderful promise. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. And Jacob wakes up from the dream awestruck surely the lord is in this place and i was not aware of it and he calls the ground where he had been sleeping bethel meaning the house of god so jacob leaves bethel a changed man having counted the living god and after bethel jacob is never the same again although as we shall go on to see old habits die hard with jacob and he's still very much the deceiver, living by his wits, rather than trusting wholly the, in the God whom appeared to him at Bethel. But now, 20 years later, Jacob has heard nothing more from the God who spoke to him at Bethel. It is not as if Jacob had forgotten about God. No, he still has a keen awareness of God watching over him. When Rachel says to him in her misery on account of her infertility, give me children or I die, Jacob replies rather insensitively in verse 2 of chapter 30, am I God who has kept you from having children? So Jacob has a consciousness of God, but it is just that God, Jacob's God has not spoken a word to him in 20 years. He's been silent. <coughs> And Jacob, of course, has been busy. He's been slaving on behalf of Laban, being a husband to two wives and to two concubines. Probably run off his feet as a father of 12 children. Perhaps in the pressure of everyday life, Jacob hadn't noticed the silence of the God who had revealed himself to him 
at Bethel. He had too much on his hands. He had too much to think about. And so 20 years pass very quickly without Jacob really taking in that he hadn't heard anything from the God of Bethel in quite a while. In the Psalms, we frequently come across, don't we, the frustrations of the psalmists regarding the silence of God. So David cries out in despair in Psalm 13, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? The psalmist laments in Psalm 42, I say to my God, to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? But in Jacob's case, I believe he was just too overwhelmed by, by what life had thrown at him to note God's silence. So the years slip quickly by without Jacob hearing anything more from the Lord. I think this is the experience of all Christians at some part, point in their lives. There are seasons of radio silence from heaven. And you're just getting on with life, working, paying the mortgage, raising children, looking after aged parents, serving in the church, and the years fly by. No sooner had the children started at school than they're leaving the family home for university. You find yourself thinking more about your pension than you do about promotion at work, as retirement from work no longer seems so very far off on the horizon. It's not that God isn't speaking to you in a general way. You're still being fed by the teaching of God's word on a Sunday, through your own personal devotions, and through the fellowship of God's people. But God has not spoken to you in a specific way, calling on you to take up a perhaps some new avenue of service, or even perhaps to lay one down in which you've grown stale in. Instead, life has gone on steadily, but uneventfully. Perhaps you've been following Paul's call to the Thessalonians. What does he write to them? Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you and that's exactly how life has been. Nothing out of the ordinary. You've worked with your own hands, not only to earn a living, but also to serve in the life of the church. But church life, home life, and work life basically follow the same pattern year after year. And God has made no major intervention in your life. He seems silent. You are in a season of spiritual silence and you've become used to this state of affairs. But the fact that God is silent does not mean that he's sleeping on the job. For he is also secondly, verse 12 of chapter 31, the God who sees, the God who sees. None of Laban's shenanigans had escaped God's attention. None of Laban's underhand dealings with Jacob had been overlooked by Jacob's God. And look at what the Lord says to Jacob in verse 12 of chapter 31. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. The Lord hadn't missed that Laban had slipped Leah into Jacob's tent on his wedding night instead of Rachel. He hadn't missed that Laban had exploited Jacob's love of Rachel to get another seven years out of work out of his son-in-law. The God of Israel hadn't missed the attempt of Laban to swindle Jacob out of his rightful income of lamb, sheep and goats. He was the God who sees. He was the God who had pledged to Jacob 20 years earlier at Bethel that he would watch over Jacob wherever he went. Even when God is silent, he is still the God who sees. He is still the God who watches over his people. And he sees when they're being mistreated. He sees when they're being unfairly treated. He sees when they suffer injustice at the hands of others. He sees what God's people do in his service. 
This is what the Lord Jesus Christ instructs John in his revelation to write to the church at Ephesus. Write this, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. This is what the Lord Jesus instructs John to write to the church in Thyatira. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. And you are now doing more than you did at first. Just like the God of Jacob had seen how hard Jacob had worked on Laban's behalf, he sees how hard his people work on behalf of his kingdom. Even when he is silent, he is still the God who sees. Even when we pass through seasons of silence, either as individual Christians or as a local body of God's people, we have a God who sees faithful Christian ministry, who recognises faithful Christian service. I know your deeds, says our God. The God who is silent, the God who sees, and then thirdly, we have in verse 3, the God who speaks. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. At last, after 20 years of silence from heaven, the Lord speaks again to Jacob. There is an old hit record from the 1960s by the Moody Blues with the title, Go Now, Go Now. And this is precisely what the Lord says to Jacob, go now, go back home. And it is a word the Lord gives with a promise. And I will be with you. Jacob would not be alone on the journey. He would not be at the mercy of his foes as he made his way home. The Lord, Jacob's God, had his back covered. And it seems that the call to return home came via a dream revelation, which Jacob goes on to repeat to Leah and Rachel in verse 13. The Lord reappears to Jacob and reintroduces himself as the God of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. R.T. Kendall in his commentary describes these words as some of the most tender found in all of scripture. When Jacob heard these words, I am the God of Bethel, he knew at once it was God who was speaking. He may not have heard God's voice in 20 years, but only he and God knew about Bethel and God's revelation of himself to Jacob there. Now, God could have uh, introduced himself as he originally did at Bethel. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. But instead, he chose to introduce himself in such a way that Jacob instinctively would know it was the true God speaking to him. Jacob, it's me. Remember the God who spoke to you all those years ago at Bethel? I am speaking to you once again. It's time to go home. Your time serving Laban in Paddan Aram is over. Our God is the God who speaks, perhaps after years of silence. How does God speak to his people today? Well, in exactly the, the way he spoke to Jacob. Through the inner witness of the heart, through the outward circumstances of life, and through the proclamation of God's word. Look at this. Jacob had the inner witness of his heart. Already after 14 years and acquiring two wives and 12 children, he felt it was right to return home. And so in chapter 30 and verse 25, he raises the matter with Laban. Jacob also experienced the outward circumstances of life. He noticed that Laban and sons were no longer favorably disposed towards him, indicating that it was time to move on. And then Jacob heard the word of God. I am the God of Bethel. Go back to your native land. Now, obviously, these three ways God guides his people need to be considered cautiously and carefully. 
the human heart is not always a reliable witness. Our feelings cannot always be trusted as an indication of God's will. Neither are our circumstances, which may change very quickly. The most important and ultimately decisive way in which God leads his people is through his word. And we can never take a course of action which is contrary to God's word. A married man may feel his heart drawn to another woman who is not his wife. The circumstances of life might bring them together. But that doesn't give him an invitation to begin an affair with her. Why? Because God's word says that marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, God's word always has the final say over the inner promptings of our hearts and the outward circumstances of our lives. But that's not to say that they are not often significant indicators of his will. The God who is silent, the God who sees, the God who speaks, and fourthly we see the God whose timing is perfect. When 20 years earlier Jacob had arrived in Paddan Aram, the only belonging that was his was the staff he held in his hand. When 14 years later he felt he should return home, although he had acquired a, a large family, he still had no property of his own. His two wives had been his reward, one of whom he had been deceived into marrying. Now, 20 years later, when God tells him to return to his homeland, Jacob is a wealthy man, and he has considerable assets of his own. But had he left Padam Aram six years earlier when he first felt the call of home, he would have left with nothing. He would have left only with a lot of mouths to feed and with no means, humanly speaking, of feeding them. So God's timing was perfect. His words spoken to Jacob to leave the home came exactly at the right time. Jacob could leave Padam Aram in the knowledge he now had the resources to support his family over the course of the journey home. God's timing was perfect. And I think that's a testimony of us. For so many of us, as we look back on our lives, God's timing has been perfect. He has engineered our circumstances to change the course of our lives in a decisive way. And in hindsight, we can see his timing was spot on. Perhaps there's been a trial to face, which we could not have dealt with earlier in our lives. But at the right time, after we become more spiritually mature, after we become more spiritually resilient, after sufficient spiritual and practical support has been put in place, we've been pleasantly surprised. We have, in fact, been able to get through a trial we never thought we would have been able to. Perhaps there has been a new sphere of service we've taken on. If we'd been asked years earlier to serve in this way, we would have said that we just don't have the wherewithal and we would have dismissed the idea. But now in God's perfect timing, when the, later the opportunity to serve arose again, this time we did feel able to take it on. We did feel sufficiently equipped by God's grace to take up this new avenue of service. 19th century congregational minister Joseph's hymn, jo Joseph Parker's hymn puts it well. Love these words, don't you? God holds the key of all unknown and I am glad if other hands should hold the key, or if he trusted it to me, I might be sad. I might be sad. The God who has been silent, the God who sees, the God who speaks, the God whose timing is perfect, and finally we see the God who is supreme. We see in chapter 31 and verse 20, that Jacob has not been able to get rid of all the old traits, of the, all the traits of his old way of life. And instead of being straight with Laban and telling him to his face that he and his household, including Laban's daughters and grandchildren, were leaving, Jacob feels it necessary 
to fall back on his dark art of deception. Jacob, the opportunist, does not give Laban the least idea he is going to make a run for it. Instead, he waits for the time that Laban is out of the way, sheep shearing, and then he saddles his donkeys. And Laban, when he realises that Jacob has fled, well, he sets off in pursuit of him. But before Jacob takes flight, Rachel, his daughter, steals his father's gods, the idols that Laban worships. Now, quite why she did this, the Bible scholars have used up copious amounts of ink debating. But it's probably true to say that she did it to spite her father. She felt aggrieved. She felt that she and Leah had been used by him for his own advantage. He hadn't cared about them. They would just been pawns in serving his own interests by getting Jacob to work for him for nothing. Anyway, Laban pursues Jacob. He catches up with him and he confronts him in verses 26 and 27. And Laban feigns hurt. He fakes an injury. Laban plays the injured father and grandfather card. What have you done? You've deceived me and you've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? But the real injury had been done to Laban's pride. Jacob's God had appeared to him and had warned him not to harm Jacob. And Laban knew that Jacob was untouchable. The Lord, Jacob's God, had his back. And so in verse 30, in desperation, Laban plays his last card. Okay, Jacob, I understand you want to leave and return home. But why did you rub salt into the wound and steal my gods? You leaving without my even being able to kiss my grandchildren and daughters goodbye is injury enough. But why did you stick the boot in and go off with my gods? And here Laban has Jacob at a disadvantage because Jacob didn't know, didn't have the foggiest idea that his father-in-law's gods had been stolen. And so in verse 32, look, Jacob makes Laban a promise that he would put to death the one who had stolen his idols, little knowing that it was his beloved Rachel. But Rachel is not her father's daughter for nothing, and she too knows a thing or two about deception, and she distracts attention away from herself by claiming, excuse the language, that it was her time of the month. And she's sitting on the very camel saddle the idols were hidden in, but claims she cannot stand up due to period pains. It all seems pretty ridiculous. But it works and Laban forgets about his idols and instead asks Jacob to enter into a sort of non-aggression pact with him in verse 44. Now we might wonder, <laughs> what is the purpose of the narrator in recording this unedifying episode in which a daughter lies to her father? What is the narrator trying to get across to his readers in the text? I believe it's this. Jacob's God is supreme. He is the true God. He is the true God who puts the fear of the Lord into Laban so he is unable to threaten or touch Jacob. And Laban has no true gods of his own to turn to. His idols are powerless. They're impotent and they're even unable to help themselves. They're at the mercy of a spiteful daughter and had been squirreled away by her in a camel's saddle. So these gods are useless to Laban. They are nothing more than a comfort blanket to him. So the text appears to be mocking the idea of idols. False gods are futile. They're about as much used as a chocolate teapot. And the text makes Laban look pathetic in wanting to be reunited with them. And it seems to be rebuking idolaters like Laban. Laban, what, why do you continue to cherish idols when you can worship the real thing? The God who has already revealed 
revealed himself to you in a dream. Laban, it's ludicrous. And the text seems to foreshadow Jonah's testimony from inside the belly of the great fish. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love. The God who is supreme. I must admit, <laughs> a narrative concerned with speckled and spotted sheep and spotted and speckled goats did not seem too promising at first glance a text to preach on. But delving deeper into these two chapters and referring back to chapter 28, there is in fact much to learn about the God of Jacob. He is the God who has been silent, not communicating with Jacob in 20 years. And he is the God who was silent for over 400 years in the period between the Old and New Testaments. And no word came from heaven until the angel of the Lord broke the silence when he appeared to Zachariah in the temple and said, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you're to call him John. He's the God who sees. He saw Jacob's hard work on behalf of Laban. He saw Jacob's mistreatment at the hand of Laban. And he sees his people's hard work today and the injustices they often suffer in his name. He's the God who speaks. He reappears to Jacob after an interlude of 20 years and he says, I am the God of Bethel, the place where you made a vow to me. And he is the God who, according to the author of the letter to the Hebrews in these last days, has spoken to us by his son. He is the God of per whose timing is perfect, commanding Jacob to, to leave Padam Aram for home just when Jacob's resources were sufficient to sustain his family, his household for the journey. And he's still the same God of impeccable timing, for just at the right time, writes Paul, when we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And he's the God who is supreme, who made labor in his pursuit of false good gods look silly. And Jesus is also supreme, who, after having provided purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So this chapter of Jacob's life comes to an end. Laban kisses his grandchildren and daughters goodbye and he returns home to Padan Aram in the knowledge he would never see them again. And Jacob also continues on his journey home and as Claire read to us at the beginning of chapter 32, he is met by the angels of God. Jacob has come full circle. This chapter of his life is book-ended by angels. At Bethel, as he slept, he had a, a vision of God, of the angels of God ascending and descending on a stairway between heaven and earth. And now, on his way home, he's comforted by the welcome of angels. His God, again, had proved to be faithful to his word. Go back home to the land of your fathers and I will be with you and this same God of Bethel is our God. Amen.